Well, I didn't like Wish. I'm sure you've all heard about Disney's latest movie, especially since it was going pretty viral for how subpar the song sounded. I let you live it for free and I don't even charge you rent. Yes, we've all seen the weirdness with this one. The adorable princess character, the odd mishmash of 3D characters and attempted 2D style for the background. Leading all the way up to its release, almost everything regarding Wish has been seen in a negative light. Now, I will say right off the bat, this isn't the worst movie or anything. It's not terrible. It's mostly just soulless, which I suppose could be seen as a bigger insult than just calling the movie bad. <laughs> the biggest thing I can say about Wish is that it's all pretty painfully bland, forgettable. Bad movies get talked about. There's things to say about bad movies. Forgettable movies just get forgotten, and I'm willing to bet this one will end up fading away into obscurity as time goes on. So what's going on with this movie? What makes it so soulless? It seemingly has all the ingredients to make a Disney formulated hit, so where did things go wrong? Well, let's dive into the world of Wish and find out. Welcome to Rosas, come on, come this way. So what even happens in this movie? Well, in case you haven't seen it yet, let me just help you get caught up. Asha, our main character here, wants to get a job as Magnifico's apprentice. He is a wizard who rules over this land called Rosas. When you turn 18, you can give him a wish in hopes that he might someday grant your wish for you and make it come true. Importantly, when you give him your wish, you also forget what it was. Asha's grandfather is turning 100 and she hopes that he'll get his wish granted, but it doesn't work out. Magnifico instead tells her his wish is too vague and could potentially be dangerous. Asha, bummed that it all didn't work out, wishes on a star and the star comes crashing down to Earth. This star is magical and she and the star plan to release everyone's wishes so they can have their wishes back. Since Magnifico admits most people's wishes don't get granted. Magnifico freaks out and turns to dark magic. Initially he claims it's to protect the people of Rosas, but after he starts consuming people's wishes to power himself up, it becomes clear it's more about keeping his own position of power. With the help of her friends and Magnifico's wife, they're able to free everyone's wishes and trap Magnifico into a mirror. And the day is saved, I guess. Wish has a surprisingly convoluted story for how overall simplistic it actually is. Starting with Asha's interview, then there's her grandfather's wish, and there's a subplot thing about her dad, and he was into stars and stuff, Magnifico freaking out, and then there's an underlying thing about him feeling like the citizens are ungrateful. When you look at it with a broad brush, it seems so simplistic, but there's so many specific details threaded throughout, so let's start looking at some of the specifics. You wanna dance on the beach? Asha, our main character, is boring unfortunately. It's such a shame. She's not even a bad character or anything. This is just the kind of thing we've seen a hundred times by now. I have no words. My mouth drooping. I feel like it's drooping. This clumsy, bubbly, modernized, hip with the kids kind of thing is nothing new. Personality-wise, Asha isn't offering anything that we haven't already seen with Mirabelle or Rapunzel or Anna. They all kind of have the same quote-unquote adorkable person to them. The problem is, those other three girls all have more depths to their characters along the way with their stories. Yes, Mirabelle is adorkable, but she's also deeply pained by not having a gift, wanting to contribute, wanting to be a part of the family. She's sassy and hardworking, she's not just that basic personality. Yeah, Rapunzel is adorkable too, but she also approaches every situation like it's magical and wonderful. She's creative and hungry for new information information and experiences. Yes, Anna's the same way, but she's also a helpless romantic. As the stories go on with these girls, they get even more depths, but Asha doesn't. She's nice, she's caring, and that's about it. Personality-wise, there's nothing specific about Asha that really stands out to me, and it doesn't help that all of her friends highlight any other personality trait she could be showing. I made a wish. On a star. What are you, five? Asha's main team of friends are all meant to represent the seven dwarves from Snow White. A lot of this movie is meant to reference other Disney films because the idea is that this was like the very beginning of Disney's universe or something. We'll touch on that topic later. But yeah, this crew of characters are the seven dwarves and they're fine, forgettable mostly. I struggle to remember any of their names here. At the very least, they do that thing where their first names match their dwarf name counterparts like this 
This is Gabo, and he's grumpy. This is Bazima, and she's bashful. This is Simon, he's sleepy. You see what they're doing with the alliteration? Like I said, they're fine, but also like their dwarf counterparts, they're not really doing anything all that interesting because of how limited their personality traits make them. Gabo is always sassy and rude, and that's it, because he's grumpy. That's all his character can be. And at least he and Dahlia get the most things to do and say, because even though their personalities can feel limited, they still have more to contribute to a conversation than most of the others. The sneezy guy especially has nothing to contribute. They're lemon! Oh no. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'll give them this. Thanks to their different body types and hair colors and skin tones, they're more visually interesting than the all sameness of the classic dwarves. But in the long run of things, the majority of them just couldn't stand out. I would have rather they've gone with one or two stronger characters than these seven watered down ones. The one that gets to stand out the most is Simon. He actually betrays the heroes and joins forces with Magnifico, sort of. It's short lived and I'm pretty sure he was just kind of being possessed for most of it. And they forgive him immediately afterwards anyways. And I wanted so badly to believe in him. He's also the only one who's 18, so he's given Magnifico his wish already. I feel like we've really missed the opportunity for the characters to have more depths if we got to know their wishes. For example, Simon's wish was to become a loyal knight. Cool, that's interesting, and we can understand more intricate elements of his character based on that information, but we never learn what any of the others would want to wish for. The whole point of the story is about how important people's wishes are, so I feel like we really missed the opportunity to play around with defining our characters based on the things they want to wish. Instead, we personify these three random background characters over and over again. The guy who, I think he just wants to climb a mountain, and then there's the lady who wants to fly, and the lady who wants to sail a ship. We see their wishes several times throughout the movie, and Magnifico even ends up sacrificing their wishes to make his staff. Why define these three characters instead of some of the main characters? Instead of these three, why not make it Gabo, Bazima, and Sa it would help to flesh out these characters more and have the stakes be even higher personally for Asha. Also, it makes the reveal of Simon being the betrayer really dumb this way. Oh, golly gee, I wonder who it could be! Who betrayed Asha? Could it perhaps be the one named character who knows Asha who's given Magnifico their wish already? After Magnifico promised to grant someone's wish if they reveal the traitor? Oh, it's a mystery! Unfortunately, even Asha doesn't really get definition thanks to her wish. I mentioned it before, and it's a big talking point throughout the film, the fact that she made a wish on a star. But what was her wish? To have something more for us than this. Something more. Just, I don't know, something. I don't know what. <laughs> Ironic that Magnifico didn't want to grant Saba's wish because it's too vague, when Asha's magical star summoning wish is the most vague thing ever. <laughs> Lastly, on our hero team, there's Valentino and Star. Valentino is the typical cute animal companion character, and unfortunately, I hate him. I'm talking, I am talking. Ah, who knew my voice would be this low? It's such a shame. Alan Tudyuk is such an amazing actor, and I hoped he could save this character, but unfortunately, Valentino ends up being what everyone was worried Olaf was going to be. He contributes very little, talks too much, isn't funny, and I can't stand him. It's crazy. I was sitting there thinking to myself, I wish Star could talk. So then Asha had someone to actually, like, talk to on this journey. Someone to help flesh out her character and personality more. But then I remembered that Valentino is there the whole time. The problem is, they don't actually talk to each other. Valentino mostly just jabber jaws in the background, saying bad jokes at poor timed moments and Asha moves forward with the plot. Good find, Valentino. My butt found it. Then there's Star. Like I said, he can't talk. In the concept art, he was originally designed to be like a magical boy and I would have loved to see that version instead. Honestly, I really wish this whole movie had some sort of romance element to it. The princess finding her true love is such an iconic element to Disney movies and it's a shame that we don't get a hint of that here. I watched the live action Little Mermaid, and you know what? It was adorable. Their romance was precious and cute and I loved it. If they can get it right, why can't your animated movies do the same? As for how Star actually is, I also kind of hate him. He doesn't talk, his antics aren't all that funny, I don't love the design of this character either, it feels too corporate. 
if that makes sense. Like, he was clearly just made this way to make merch, right? Like, scientifically created to be cute so they can pump out toys and plushies and whatever. And it's technically fine. It is cute. I don't know, I just wanted something with, like, a real personality, I guess. He's just generally happy the whole time. He feels basic and bland. Honestly, it's not just the Seven Dwarf characters who feel like one-note archetypes. All of the characters in this movie feel that way. Even Asha's grandpa and mother feel like they're just there to look sad so it fuels her to move forward with the plot. This movie has a larger cast than most Disney films, and yet it feels like there's no real characters. And I know Disney can execute large casts really well. We just had Encanto. There's 12 characters in the Madrigal family, and they all feel interesting and fleshed out, even the ones with minimal screen time. So why does Asha and her gang of friends feel so empty? Well, if I had to guess, I think it's because Wish focuses a lot more on moving its plot forward. There's not a lot of downtime for the characters to just stop and quip with each other, give a little bit more depth to who they are, and I think it's especially a problem with Wish's songs. But that's a topic I'll dive into in a little bit. For now, let's talk about... So Wish just has one and a half villains, if we count Simon's three minute long betrayal. Which I think is weird. You just heard me, right? Seven dwarves, Asha, the goat, and Star. Hell, even Magnifico's wife teams up with the heroes after he starts playing with dark magic. So all of those characters versus just Magnifico? Now I get the idea that he's the only one with magic. In a world where everyone else is just normal folks, the one magic user would be a threat to face. Except the problem is, Star is also magical. There's a deeper problem with the story that their magic systems are never really explained. Magnifico's magic seems to be alchemy based. He's often doing things with Bunsen burners. He whips out a cauldron at one point in time. He eventually makes a staff for himself, but I don't quite understand how his magic magic system works? Is this something anyone could learn? Or do you need to have, like, magical blood or something? And Stars' magic is actually really painfully undefined. Asha meets Star and he starts making all the animals and plants talk. This is crazy. We love crazy! <gasps> If I was Asha, I would assume he only has the power to make things talk. That's the main thing he does throughout the majority of the movie. But later, he makes his own wand for Asha to use. He can lift things, stars his power, and the extent of what he can do is never really laid out, making him feel like a plot MacGuffin most of the time. Back to Magnifico, however, he has the ability to take people's wishes. But that doesn't seem to require any sort of spell, he can just do that, I guess. It's the same thing when he grants their wishes. It's just very not well explained. And ultimately, this is all unimportant. I don't think the kids watching this movie will really care about the intricacies of this world's magic system. It's just that that I do. <laughs> I like magic systems, so I was thinking about it. And magic is sort of a core element for so many Disney movies that I went into this movie assuming the magic systems of the story would play a larger role, but it doesn't. It's just a thing that I was thinking about and I didn't know where else to put that in this review, so I just said it here. Because Magnifico's magic is really the crux of his whole character. Like I said, it's what makes him a threat against our regular heroes. So let's talk about Magnifico as a character. I'm honestly amazed that Disney has created one of the most sympathetic characters in the history of their movies with him. Keep you safe here in my arms. Magnifico is introduced to us in this precious, sweet perspective. He's kind and understanding, even in the face of Asha's quirky, over-the-top everything. He explains that in his old home, the place was destroyed by raiders and thieves. At least I think it was raiders. He's a little vague about it. My entire family, our lands were destroyed. We then get this big, beautiful song all about how he loves the wishes. He protects them. He thinks they're the best parts of Rosa's. And he only starts to show signs of his antagonistic perspective once Asha asks him to grant her Sava's wish. But unfortunately, it's too dangerous. Saba's wish is to inspire the next generation, and Magnifico says it's too vague. He could inspire the next generation to try to overthrow Rosa's, inspiring a rebellion. Now, we, the audience, and Asha in-universe knows that's not what Sabina would want to do. But Magnifico shuts her down. Immediately, it's clear that Magnifico's problem is that he's overprotective, which makes sense. His last home was destroyed, and he loves and cares about this home so much that he's gone to such great lengths 
truce to keep them all safe, that he's accidentally suppressing the people of Rosas. So scared that something is gonna destroy his home again, that even something like inspiring the next generation fires off warning signs inside of him. This makes for a fascinating villain, and one of the most sympathetic ones Disney's ever had. There's been a big stint lately, especially with Disney, where they don't really have villains. Encanto is a good example. Abuela's not a wicked person, she's just misguided and is accidentally hurting rather than helping. There's also been a big stint of twist villains, like with Frozen or Coco, where we meet the villain and for the majority of the film we're meant to trust them, until towards the end of the story where there's a big reveal where we find out they're actually the bad guys. And Magnifico is weird because I don't think he's supposed to be either of those things. Because even though he is initially introduced to us in this very sympathetic, very understanding way, and it's not until about halfway through the movie that he starts doing legitimately bad things, he just doesn't fit the mold. Right away, Asha is clear that he holds the opposite viewpoint as she does with the wishes. He starts barking and yelling at her long before he starts sucking up wishes for dark magic. So it's not a twist, but then he's also not shown to be given any sympathy either. There's no redemption at the end for him, no understanding, nothing. Instead, he gets locked away, presumably forever, inside of a mirror, because I'm pretty sure it's implied that he becomes the magic mirror we see in Snow White. So it's weird that he seems so understandable. Funny enough, his biggest problems, at least initially, is exactly the thing Asha said was her biggest flaw. Quick, oh. ask me an interview question. Uh, okay, Asha, what's your weakness? You care too much. I do? Wait, is that a weakness? That's why it's perfect. I care too much. Magnifico actually does care too much. All of his motivations seem to be fear-based. When he sees the shooting star, he instantly thinks it might be some sort of invading force coming to threaten Rosa's. Then, in the middle, we hint towards this idea of him feeling unappreciated. What would comfort us? Uh, another wish ceremony? Yeah. It would make us all feel so much Please, better! Your we could do it now! You can think about a wish-granting ceremony! It's like this whole thing. He spends all his time protecting their wishes, granting the ones he thinks will make Rosa's a better place, and all these people care about are their own greedy desires to see their own wishes coming true. He's trying to stop a presumed threat, and they're all begging him to grant their wishes instead. And I thought that was going to be the angle we're going with. But then suddenly it's all about vanity. I can't help it if mirrors love my face. Um, what? There's only been one moment that even hinted towards Magnifico being vain, and it was his wife telling him he's handsome and then he agrees with her. You are their handsomest, most beloved king. You're right. I am a handsome king. So his villain song kicking off with a bunch of self-compliments about his beauty really comes out of nowhere. It wasn't even related to the last thing he was saying before the song started. It's not just the sudden vanity either. It's suddenly wanting for constant praise. Someone praise me for my benevolence! He suddenly gets painted like a dictator of sorts. Parts of his song implies that he would be willing to sacrifice others for the greater good of Rosa's, but that's not a thing that's been hinted at. And it's all weird because he's already been showered in praise and love from all the people of Rosa's, and up until now, he hasn't seemed like that was important to him. Everything, everything I do is to make sure that never happens again. I don't understand how the character could be painted as so sympathetic, so understanding, scared and worried, worried enough to potentially do something forbidden just for the sake of his people, but then the movie hits the halfway point and he becomes a Cusco-esque, all about me, me, me personality? I've seen concept art that one of the original ideas was both Magnifico and his wife Amaya would both be villains, and maybe that's what's happened here. This feels like the characterization of two different people. The greedy, vain, self-absorbed one who wants to be treated like a god versus the sympathetic, overly cautious one who doesn't want to see their kingdom be destroyed like the one from their childhood. Probably one of these characteristics was for Amaya's original villainess personality, but I guess as that idea got scrapped, the two personalities got murdered together into Magnifico, but it really does make it feel like the man in the first half and the man in the second half are completely different characters. For the sake of this story, I wish he would have been much more ruthless. This is meant to be a love letter for the classics of Disney, right? Well, he's just not brutal enough, unforgiving, dangerous. He's not anything to really stand out. Yeah, he doesn't grant everyone's wishes, but he seems to have good intentions behind that reasoning. And then when he starts sucking up people's wishes for his own powers, they're not even hurt by it. They just feel sad. My heart knows this feeling. 
This is grief. But that's it. Honestly, quite frankly, I don't think he needed a big battle or needed to get sucked into the mirror dimension. I think we could have just had a reasonable understanding if we just talked with him. I don't know. I don't think he's evil. I just think he has unpacked trauma. <laughs> I brought up the sympathetic villain trope because this really feels like the best example of how to write a villain who would later get redeemed. So it's so weird that we instead really try to pretend like he's this unredeemable, vain monster. It's all just so confused. He's too sympathetic to be truly irredeemable, but he's too vain and power hungry to be shown mercy. It's weird. His whole characterization really muddies the whole plot of the movie too. Now that I've discussed both the hero's and the villain's perspective on the story, something about it just doesn't feel quite right. I've seen several people musing that it sort of feels like Asha could be seen as the villain in the story. While I don't necessarily agree with this idea, I do totally understand where these people are coming from. I think it's an unfortunate side effect of just how complacent everything really is in this storyline. Like I said, Magnifico isn't really all that brutal. He's not really doing anything nefarious or dangerous to his people. At least not until Asha starts freaking him out. I expected there to be some sort of evil reveal with Magnifico. The thing that really tips him over the edge. Maybe something like learning that he killed Asha's dad because he once too tried wishing on a star. Maybe Magnifico would kill Asha's Saba or her mother. And that all sounds sad and gruesome, but also, this is Disney. Major character deaths are nothing new to them. Scar kills Mufasa. That's the thing that really tips his character into being a real villain. It's one thing to be conniving. It's another to actually push the limits and kill your own family members. It's the thing that makes Scar's actions truly unredeemable. So then we cheer when he gets his ultimate defeat in the end. Dr. Facilier kills one of our main characters, Ray. Again, it makes him unredeemable and makes his ultimate demise feel deserved. But Magnifico doesn't ever do anything like this. There are no deaths done by his hands. So when he gets sucked up into the mirror, I can't help but wonder, did he really deserve this? It's not just for the benefit of the villains too, though. Ray's death inspired and motivated Tiana and the gang to do whatever it took to stop Dr. Facilier. Or in a story like Bambi, while he doesn't talk about his mother's death much, it solidifies the hardships that he has to face as he grows up without her now, making the hero's specific struggles more understandable and gives them more dimension as they grow throughout the story. So it's not just Magnifico whose character arc is hurt by this lack of true danger or death. Asha's fight to stop Magnifico Magnifico feels kind of hollow. What's she fighting for that she couldn't just do by being inspiring on her own? Losing your wish makes you sad, but it doesn't take away all of your ambition. Her mother loses her wish, yet she still stands and sings against Magnifico's final stand. She seems fine. Yeah, that wish is gone. But wouldn't you naturally come up with new ambitions, even with that one wish out of your system? It doesn't help that Asha's story gets painted as a big revolution. Revolution hit the ground running! But what are you actually revolting against? Because let's be real, Magnifico's actually doing a pretty decent job at being king. Asha herself even sang a big ol' song about how amazing and wonderful Rosa's is. And while having the chance to make a wish come true definitely helps to add to the people's joy while living here, it's also definitely not the only thing that makes us a good place. Asha turning around and inciting a revolution feels so silly when you see just how happy everyone is. And it ends up painting Asha and her friends in a really negative light, which this is where I can see the arguments that Asha is actually the bad guy coming from. If Asha hadn't have wished on a star, nothing bad would have happened. Magnifico wouldn't have freaked out and started to dabble with dark magic. Instead, everything would still be good in the big, perfect city of Rosa's. Some people get their wishes granted, most don't. Asha might not like it, but like, that's life, right? Whether it's at the hands of a magical wizard or if you kept your wish, you don't always guarantee it coming true. Wishes or not, the people of Rosa's would still have been happy because they're all on board with Magnifico's wish system all the way to the very end. While Asha and her friends are gasping in shock and horror, everyone else in the city is cheering and all smiles. It's not until the very end when Magnifico finally loses it in his desperation to catch Asha when they all see that their wishes go dark. Which brings me to another Another important point. No one cares until it affects them personally. Identifies the traitor. Your wish will be granted. Yeah! 
Asha is all on board with Magnifico's way of granting wishes, up until she finds out her personal family member won't ever have his wish granted. And the movie really goes to great lengths to try to make it not look like something selfish. Instead, really trying to paint Asha like someone who just wants her family to be happy. I wished for more for us, for my family. Not in like a selfish way. I just want their wishes to have a chance. But given the circumstances of how it all works out, it does feel rather selfish. She seemingly started a whole revolution just because her personal family members didn't get to win the lottery. And it doesn't help that she seems singularly minded towards this idea too. We open the movie with her talking about Saba maybe getting his wish granted. Then she goes and tells her friends and they all talk about Saba getting his wish granted. And then in the middle of her Welcome to Rosa's song, she talks tells all these newcomers about hoping Saba gets his wish granted. Then she meets Magnifico and immediately asks him about Saba's wish. Then when she breaks in later, she only bothers taking her personal family members' wishes. Looking at all of this, it does feel like Asha only cared because she personally didn't get everything she wanted. Think of it this way. If Magnifico had granted Saba his wish, but still only granted one wish a month, would she have cared? Look at the sequence. They're both singing about the wishes and how beautiful they are. And then the moment she spots Saba's wish, she breaks through the crowd, dodging everyone else's wishes just to fixate on him. While we see Magnifico still looking at all of the wishes, seeing them all as equally beautiful, while Asha disregards all of the others to only focus on the one that personally matters to her. It's not just Asha, too. All of her dwarf-inspired friends were on board with Magnifico all the way until Simon called them out for being traitors. Once again, the characters only care once they are personally affected by this. And it's fine to take action against something that you have to personally deal with, but the fact that no one in Rosa's seems to care at all? Rosa's is painted as this perfect utopia, and everyone seems pretty chill with how things are working out. So I don't know. It doesn't feel like Asha's sparking a revolution for the betterment of Rosa's only the betterment of herself and her personal relationships. That's why I think we needed Magnifico to be more brutal, to do something truly evil. Because the way it works out, I can't help but sit here and think, if she hadn't have wished on a star, everyone would still be perfectly happy and fine. It doesn't seem like Magnifico was an inherently evil person who needed to be stopped for the betterment of Rosa's. It seems like Asha's actions made him evil. Which unfortunately paints her in a pretty negative light light. So Disney has claimed that they went with this art style in an attempt to reference both its traditional 2D and its more modern 3D art. Unfortunately, it just ends up looking like a half-assed version of both and I don't like it. It just looks unfinished to me. Like when you see behind the scenes videos of unrendered animations, the first time I saw this style in a trailer, that's literally what I thought I was watching. And I think it's the shadows. Everything feels very flat. There's no depth on their faces especially. Also, let's just just hit pause for a second so you can see that there's some things that look like they have painted on textures to give the illusion that this is 2D. The backgrounds obviously, but also some of the characters' clothes. The outlines on their fabrics and the patterns all feel 2D animated. Except for their heads. Their heads and faces don't have any qualities like that, and it just feels distinctly like a 3D model. So what ended up happening here is this weird hodgepodge mess of art styles, and it feels like it just falls into the uncanny valley. Usually when a show or a movie has two clearly different art styles, it's meant to cause uneasiness in the viewer. A distortion of reality in a way. On top of that, the designs of the actual outfits for these characters are pretty bland. Something I hate, Asha has this one part on her skirt that's crumpled up stylistically, and that's fine, except in motion, it doesn't actually look like real fabric. It instead looks like it's a painted on texture, like an Animal Crossing. You can paint onto the fabrics for your character, but once they turn, you can see that it's not a 3D rendered model, it's a flat texture. And I get that a lot with Asha's outfit especially. I just couldn't help but think of Mirabelle while looking at this. Mirabelle's dress has so many amazing details, and you could really see all the ways the threads actually popped off of her dress. Not only with the intricate stitching of her embroidery, but the frills and the ruffles of her skirt, and everyone else's designs in the movies too. Maybe the seven dwarf characters would have stood out a lot more if their outfit didn't feel so basic. Looking at the majority of the characters, especially the background characters, 
It just made me think of Shrek. Except that the characters in Wish also have these goofy, stretchy faces that feel more at home with those Grubhub ads. I'm a quick learner and a hard worker, and I, I help well, <laughs> and I'm young, so I'm malleable. They're the same picture. There's something about the way the characters talk and move that doesn't feel right to me. Their mouths all do that thing where they stretch over to the one side of their face. Maybe it's their pronounced teeth that's throwing me off. Maybe it's the actual voice acting. Something about all this just doesn't feel like it really matches up with the lip syncing half the time. I just say it like that. Like what? What are you up to? What makes you think that I'm up to something? Another big thing is the way the characters move. Asha especially. It's very frantic, flaily. It's too much. Overacted? How do I put this? Have you ever seen those TikToks of people pushing their acting in an attempt to look akin to an animated character? Now, I'm not making fun of these people. This sort of thing takes a lot of skill and coordination that I definitely don't possess. But when I personally watch these sorts of videos, I can't help but feel that uncanny valley effect. Again, it's just slightly off. It's not quite the way humans normally move. It makes sense I'd feel this way watching these TikToks, that's the whole point. But I can't help but feel that way with Asha's movements too. And I think it might be the combining of the 2D and 3D styles. It just doesn't have quite the right sense of squash or stretch for either of these styles to be trying to play with. 2D can play around a lot more with breaking the physics of the character, especially for comedic purposes. 3D animation usually works with a more grounded sense of realism. Combining these two is hard, and I don't think Wish really nails it, and I think that's why every character just doesn't look quite right. Another thing is the backgrounds and environments. The whole movie movie is pretty bland and basic looking. Every location looks samey and has a washed out color palette. While it does help make the more colorful character designs pop more, it also means every scene feels kind of empty. The 2D style for the backgrounds means the characters don't really feel like they're living in this world. It feels like when you're watching a stage play and you can tell the characters are just standing in front of a painted backdrop. They can't actually touch those objects or engage naturally in the scenery. It works for stage, but in a whole 3D world, it just makes it feel empty. Empty is really the best word I can use to describe the visuals of this movie. Characterless, styleless, an odd mix of different ideas but not fully figured out in either way. Jack of all trades, master of none, with no creativity, nothing unique, nothing big, grand, or awe-inspiring. Nothing like we've seen with prior beloved Disney classics. No dragons, no intricate underwater worlds, no stark colors, no detailed living spaces or environments, no stunning showstoppers, it's all just empty. They're fine, you know, they're not terrible, but they're just sort of fine. A little generic sounding, honestly, a little forgettable. Like, they're, they're nice to listen to, though. Like, they're far from being annoying or anything, but they're not really all that stand out, especially compared to the usual that we see from Disney. Musically, they're all just sort of fine, but I do think there's a huge problem with Wish's songs, and it's actually the visuals. The visuals for every single song is so wasted. What I was just talking about earlier with giving Asha's friends more personalities. These songs could have been a way to do that. They join in on a song and it could have been a cool way to give them some depth, to imply some more character to them based off of what song choices they go with, but instead every single song is just characters standing around and singing. And that's not bad on its own, a lot of great Disney songs do that, but it's what they're doing while they're singing. Playing around with the visuals and the styles. Mulan doesn't just walk around and sing, we see her as she watches her reflection, trying to grapple with who she wants to be. Splitting her makeup in half to imply the two sides of the world she wants to be seen from. Who she wants to be versus who she's expected to be. There's a lot going on. It's not just standing around in a room. And I don't think Wish ever fully understands the point of having the visuals accompany the point of the song. Lion King. I just can't wait to be king. The world goes into this bright stylistic flair, showing Simba's creativity being a visual spectacle for the sake of the visual medium we're watching. Frozen. Yeah, Elsa is just walking up a mountain, but we watch her transform with the song. She figures out the extent of her powers, she embraces her new sense of self as the sun rises. Wish doesn't do anything like that. It's all very safe. Everything is done in-universe. There's no creative styles or anything. 
And we don't establish or develop anything new during the songs either. Instead, the important parts surround the songs, making them all feel kind of unnecessary, like filler. To go into further detail, let's tackle each song. And if we're gonna do that, we might as well also go from worst to best with a ranking video, right? I'm a star! This is, hands down, the most pointless song. It's after Star gets revealed, only a minute or two after the song before this one. He starts making the animals talk and whatever, and she's all confused by it. And I guess this was like an attempt to set up what the magic is. We are all overwhelmed. But they don't really explain anything. Instead, it's just, you're a star. Everyone's a star. We're all connected. It's like the circle of life, but worse, I guess. It's so annoying to me because like, they set up all of these questions beforehand, right? Have you ever wondered why you look up at the sky for answers? What forms the rings in the trees, turns a pine from a sea? But then the answer is just, You really wanna know just who you are? A star. What does that mean though? Like, like you're special is the point of the song, everyone's a main character in their own stories. It also doesn't explain any of Asha's questions from the beginning. Starting with, how did I manage to connect with a star all the way across the sky? You can't just say, you're special and call it a day. I'm actually curious. You brought up these questions. Answer your own questions. How is this a thing? We are our own origin story. I cannot think of a worse fate than being a sentient tree. Why the hell would you do this? They can't move. They're stuck there for all of eternity, forced to feel as every living creature scrabbles up their bark to gnaw their leaves, feeling the millions of ants marching across their roots, cursed to never leave this one spot in the middle of an empty forest, cursed to live for centuries as you watch all of your animal friends dying around you since trees live for a very long time. I hate this. <laughs> watch out world, here I are. Of course, the premise of the song isn't nearly that sinister. It's just kind of bland. Cute and uplifting, I guess, but you could just cut it from the movie and lose nothing. I'd prefer a song that actually establishes the extent of what Star can do. That was the premise that led into this song, but all we see is him making animals talk and it feels like a waste of time to linger on this you're a star thing for three minutes. They just don't say anything actually important. When it comes to the universe, we're all shareholders. Get back to your system! Soda. Yeah, that didn't mean anything. Like actually, those words didn't actually say anything relevant to the scene, this movie, or anything. It's just fluff. The song equivalent of cheap popcorn. So I make this wish. I'll cover the majority of my talking points when it comes to the regular version. This is the reprise. I prefer the solo version with just Asha versus this one with the chorus we see here. And when Asha joins in on the singing, it's more screamy than I would prefer. Go! And the song gets interrupted a lot. That's because this is literally the climax. And as far as climaxes go, this is pretty bland. Everyone kind of just believes a bit harder and they magically win. There's no fight, not even much of a struggle. They don't even need to do anything to get Magnifico sucked into his staff. They just sing and it's over. For being the literal final battle against the villain of the film, this is pretty lame. Cause here in the city it's trying so hard to be the family madrigal, but it just isn't. It's a lot of exposition, which I do actually like. Songs and musicals are best utilized to help jazz up exposition, make it more fun and catchier to learn all this important stuff. And he keeps them safe every wish he acquires and what's the monthly grant someone's greatest desire. Fun fact, I checked the comments section under this official song posted on YouTube and it's odd. Over 100,000 views, but less than 200 comments. And they're all so positive too. But when I checked the comment section under you're a star, it's all pretty overwhelmingly negative. Disney, are you deleting comments? Disney, how dare naughty, naughty mouse. <laughs> I will give it this. Apparently Roses is in the Mediterranean Sea somewhere, and this is the only song that seems to really lean into that cultural background for the film. The rest of the movie in general just kind of feels generic in that regard, vaguely European-ish. So it's nice seeing it at least hinted at here, uh, but it's pretty forgettable in the long run though. And this is the thanks I get. Such a shame. 
Chris Pine is a good singer. He sings another song on this list, and I'll let you know right now, it's gonna make it a lot higher than most of the others. So he can sing. I watched Dungeons and Dragons. He can sing. So it's crazy, this song is so unimpressive by comparison. Ungrateful much? Mm, are you sure that you're not the prop? I'd love to see you try and do my job. I don't even think it's his actual singing that makes it such a bleh song. I think it's the lyrics. Buffoonish, goofy, weird. Honestly, this song feels like it's written by a totally different person than the rest of the soundtrack. There's a traitor in this town and still I remain unbent. There's just no flow to the lyrics. The rhymes are choppy, which is weird given how simplistic the actual wordplay being used here is like that part from I'm a star when it comes to the universe we're all shareholders like yeah it made no sense but at least it used some interesting wordplay that had some good rhythm to it a lot of this song doesn't have that at all it's all pretty weirdly paced some sentences get stretched out too far for the sake of fitting a rhyme but it doesn't flow very naturally together and it's very distracting in fact you might be so distracted with how bad the lyrics are that you might miss the fact that Chris Pine is actually doing a pretty good character character performance for this one. This is the I get. So how did this song rank higher than most of the others on my list? Because damn it, it just keeps getting stuck in my head. It helps with how repetitive it is. It's a really big earworm in that regard. <laughs> Also, out of all of the songs, this is the one that plays with the visuals the most. Thanks to Magnifico's magic, he's able to jazz up some of the visuals with his illusions and levitation skills. It's probably the most recognizable song out of the film too, for better or for worse. <laughs> but I'll take a bad, memorable song over a boring, pointless song any day. So it's big and grand, which is cool. Her singing voice is lovely, especially in this song. Once again, it's the lacking visuals that really holds it back. There's just not really much to look at during the song. The locations aren't interesting enough. Her running around isn't really adding anything. They climb this tree and that's nice, I guess. But overall, visually, we could have played with our visual medium a lot more. But the actual song is nice to listen to. So I look up at the stars. I think it has some of the best lyrics out of the soundtrack, but uh, if you've been listening, you know that's not necessarily hard to do. <laughs> I could see some kid out there feeling inspired by this one. It really is the bland visuals holding it back to number three on my list, though. You at all cost. Here we go. All the previous songs on my list, I would not bother looking up or listening to again in my free time. Like, I listen to Make Up Man Out of You, or He Is Not One of Us, or Colors of the Wind, or We Don't Talk About Bruno, and lots more Disney bangers. Only these last two songs on my list are songs I would bother wanting to re-listen to in a recreational way. Remember what I just said about Chris Pine being a good singer? This is what I mean. You still amaze me after all this time. I'm not gonna lie, this song is beautiful. It's magical and beautiful, and I think it gets the closest to doing what the movie wanted to do with its message. This is the one time I can really feel the power of these people's wishes, and the overwhelming love from Asha and Magnifico to protect them. It feels like a song a parent would sing about their child, and it's really touching. I fight for you in ways you can't imagine, felt this no I haven't, I hope. Also, how often do we get a song where the villain and the hero are doing a duet? That's crazy. <laughs> the visuals are also pretty great in this one too. We get to look at a bunch of different people's wishes and you can see just how much it inspires Asha. Also, again, thanks to Magnifico's levitation spells, we play around with doing some fanciful visuals with the shapes of the wishes and the room and whatever. It's great. It's beautiful. I would even go as far to say that this is technically the best executed song for the film. But it's not number one because this is a ranking list of my dumb opinions and I tend to prefer songs that have a little bit more dance to it. So let's tackle number one already. Knowing what we know now. Knowing what we know now. This movie 
has a banger cast, and it's criminal that so many of them only get bit parts for this song. This song got me hyped. I was pumped. This is one of the last songs in the whole film, too. I was not into the movie the entire time. Then this song hit, and I did a 180. I was ready to friggin' fight. The dwarf character war anthem being the big highlight of the film was not what I was expecting, but here we are. <laughs> so is true colors and shades of green. The majority of the lyrics are simplistic, but appropriately powerful for the premise of the song, but this one was just too silly for me. Because of me and that's a lie, 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 lie. Wow. It's so much of a lie that she had to say it four times in a row. No other words could have been added to that sentence or rhymed with the word lie. That must mean it's one really big lie then, huh? It's so bad. <laughs> I will admit, a lot of the fun and power behind the premise of their lyrics doesn't really add up in relation to the events of the actual movie. No, I'm not the only one that's yeah! fed up. Yeah! Yes, hearing the squad singing about starting a revolution is technically cool. That idea is cool to me. It would make for an actually entertaining story premise. But when you sit back and think about the actual movie, movie, a lot of these lyrics really don't actually make a lot of sense with the plot. It's not just this song though, all of the songs. It feels like the songs were written for a different script. That's why the sympathetic king who survived his prior home being destroyed is suddenly singing about how pretty he is out of nowhere. That's why there's no real answers to what Star is or why he's helping Asha. I just can't decide if the songs were made first and the script got workshopped to fit the lyrics, or was it the other way around and the script was made Made, and that the songs were hastily thrown into the movie in an attempt to use the scrapped remains of some other musical's plot devices. Tell what we're becoming, hear it in the way we're I can't deny, I think the song is pretty great though. It's really different from the rest of the soundtrack. It feels big, it feels powerful, compared to This Is The Thanks I Get, which is just a generic lazy sounding pop song, or the majority of the rest of the soundtrack, which feels very, very generic. This song plays around with explosive percussions, and I like how they play around with that in-universe too. Seeing the characters drumming away on barrels and bottles makes it feel weighty, but the best part is when the queen finds them. I've seen too many bad things that I can't keep count. Yes! Yeah, let's do this! Her voice is amazing. Why is this the only song she's in? Same with Gabo and Hall. Why? They're all great. They all should have done way more. Though, let's nitpick. What was it you just said? Seen too many bad things that I can't keep count. Too many things to count? Honey. One. Two. That's it. If you wanted to count the individual wishes that he sucked up, the number goes up to four. But you know, I think you should be able to count that high. <laughs> I shouldn't judge. Math isn't everyone's strong suit, I guess. Knowing what I know now. The song is fun, and the hard, crazy drums and heavy tone for the lyrics just makes a tasty song soup for my brain. But this is another perfect example at wasted visuals. I assume you've been looking at the screen. You can see the characters. They're collecting items and stuff. It looks like they're assembling something, enacting a plan, getting things prepared for their ultimate mission to beat the king. But no. Instead, the whole song is just them putting together objects to make shadow puppets of Magnifico so they can glare at them. In him I've watched it yeah, great visual representation, guys, but like, I don't know, do something? That's the point of the songs, right? For you to be doing something at this time. You're not- you're not doing anything! Do something! <laughs> it's true for all of the songs in this movie. It just feels like everything stops for the sake of watching the characters sing for a bit. Musicals are supposed to blend the story into the songs. The plot and the music should feel intrinsically stitched together. A song like Knowing What I Know Now could have been an opportunity to see a montage of the characters getting ready, but they don't do that. None of the songs uses its time or resources to further the plot or characters along. If you listen to the song songs on their own, could you even tell what movie they're from? Understand what part of the story the song takes place in? Only time will tell, but I'm not so sure any of these songs, good or bad, will end up as timeless Disney classics. Wish. And there you have it, Poof, there's your wish! 
So there's a lot of plot points and important elements for this movie that I think would have benefited the film if we got more detail or explanation to some of it. What do apprentices do? Asha initially wants to be Magnifico's apprentice, but they explain that only Magnifico is allowed to use magic. Magic is forbidden by anyone other than Magnifico! <laughs> so what would she even be doing? When the queen is talking to her beforehand, it sounds like she's just explaining the things a maid would be required to do. Always keep the fire going because the king likes his tea hot. Like anyone could do that, right? Apprenticeship implies they'd be learning about spell casting. Asha, in the end, even gets a magic wand to become a fairy godmother, but she doesn't seem to even care about casting her own magic throughout the movie. That doesn't seem to be a reason as to why she wanted to be his apprentice. With her applying for the apprenticeship and eventually getting the wand, you'd think that'd be a big motivational factor for her, but no. She doesn't even talk about wanting to use magic the whole movie. Our fairy godmother. Mother? I mean, what else? <laughs> <laughs> no. What happened to the other apprentices? They mentioned that he's had apprentices before. Did they die? If not, why stop being his apprentice? They imply that a perk of being his apprentice is the fact that he's more likely to grant you or your family's wishes. He shows Asha the wishes. Did the prior apprentices get to see them too? Surely they would have. Did none of them ever consider the same thing Asha thinks about giving the wishes back if he's not going to grant them? What was Simon like before giving up his wish? I don't know. You're kind of boring now. Do you all think that? Achoo. No, not boring. Just calmer. How is he boring? Are we implying he's sleepy now because he's given up his wish? I would get it if the wish giving implied complacency from the people, loss of ambition, and just going through the motions, but everyone else seems totally normal. We even get to see some background random characters giving up their wishes. I wish we could have gotten to see Simon before and after giving up his wish to better explain what they mean by he's boring now. Especially since giving up your wish is implied to be a bad thing in the longer terms of the story. What was her mom's wish? It's not really that important in the long run, but still, just like with her friends, I think knowing her mom's wish would have helped to give her some character. Hell, she's the least developed character in the whole movie. Honestly, you could cut her out entirely and nothing would be different. So does no one tell each other their wishes? Asha's big thing is thinking that if Magnifico isn't going to grant their wishes, he should give them back so that people can try to make their wishes come true on their own. This hinges on the concept that no one knows what you wish for because after you give up your wish you don't remember what it was but like do you just not tell anyone what your wish would be? Like Simon wished to be a loyal knight. Did none of the others know this was what he wanted? Did he not talk about it with his friends and family? Any of them? Does no one in the whole town actually talk about what they wish for? Like if Asha just told Saba his wish was to inspire someone, would he just get the wish back naturally inside of him? The problem is no one's wishes are a guarantee. Hope is fine. Ambition is fine. But Asha's acting like freeing the wishes will make them all come true. And that isn't always the case. And it's weird that the movie hinges on this concept. How did no one realize that not everyone's wishes would be coming true? They set up that there's a wish ceremony once a month usually. There's hundreds of citizens and more and more arriving every day because this city is so amazing to live in apparently. Obviously at this rate, not everyone's wishes are going to happen. The people of roses kind of seem really selfish. They're all getting really upset at Magnifico because they all can't win the lottery. Why is this such a shock to Asha? How did no one think of this before? He doesn't even force you to give him your wish or anything. If you turn 18 and realize the odds of being the one picked out of hundreds is slimmer than you like, then you can just keep your wish. Why are you all getting up in arms about this? It's obvious. Won't even visit when you say I've compared Wish to a lot of prior Disney movies throughout this review, and that's very intentional. The idea is that this movie is a progenitor of all Disney movies. This is supposedly the origin story of where all of Disney's magic comes from. The people's wishes eventually will become future Disney movies. Fantasyland in the sky. How about Neverland? <laughs> and yet, it doesn't really feel like a classic Disney love letter. Like I've said, there's no 
Prince Charming, no magical sweep-you-off-your-feet romance that's a staple of the older films, Magnifico as a villain isn't nearly as iconic or overly threatening like classic Disney villains. It's not inspired by a classic fairy tale like how Disney films used to be. No, instead, this feels like everything in this movie is made to somehow just be a reference. And so the whole movie boils down to, <laughs> Did you get it? A dream of a utopian metropolis where all mammals are equal. Look, her friends are the seven dwarves. Get it? Oh look, that bunny did the thumper thing. Did you get it? Hey, thanks for not eating me, John. Don't mention it, Bambi. Wow, did you get it? With their names? Look, Dopey holds up Valentino like he's Simba. Oh look, it's Mickey ears. It's hidden Mickeys. Wow, did you get it? But did you get it? That guy is just Peter Pan. Like, of all the things, that is just straight up whole ass just Peter Pan. <laughs> the weird thing, Peter Pan is the movie that gets the most references in this story, which is fine. Like, I like Peter Pan too, but there are so many other movies, and it's weird how much is just Peter Pan references. Anyways, a story that relies heavily on the audience getting all the references isn't terrible, but there's got to be some sort of emotion to the story around those references. Cute nods and easter eggs are great, but you can't make a whole movie just around that idea. Wish is like the Disney equivalent of X-Ray and Vav, and that's really not good. And the worst thing about all these references and stuff is I I honestly wish they went even harder with it. Go crazy. If this is truly the progenitor of all of Disney, then go all the way. And it would be so easy with all these stupid wishes. God, I hate how they wasted the wishes in this movie. Despite being the most important part of the story, the keystone to the plot, to the character's actions, the thing that the damn film is named for, the wishes themselves are so underutilized. We should have gotten to see way more wishes from these characters. Every single wish wish should have hinted to some sort of Disney trope or movie or character or something. The way the movie is now, it definitely doesn't feel like some big origin to all of Disney. It just feels like a Disneyland tour. Swing by our gift shop to grab your Star and Valentino plushies. I called the movie soulless because it doesn't feel like a Disney love letter. It just feels like a Disney advertisement. One big commercial for itself and it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It's so corporate feeling. So basic, bland, uninspired. Magic is so powerful in Disney, inspiring others, giving the audience hope and the desire to also wish upon a star. And this movie has none of that. It just feels like a paint-by-numbers cash grab meant to prey upon people's nostalgia for the franchise. And it's lame. Overall, Wish is really unimpressive. It's not very impressive with its visuals, the soundtrack feels lazy and thoughtless, and what really kills me is the fact that this was supposed to be their big 100 year celebration movie. That's why they tried to set up this as the progenitor of all of Disney. All of those references and everything throughout the film. The idea was to celebrate a hundred years. And that's no small feat. A hundred years! A century! From such humble origins, pioneering revolutionary animation techniques, making movies about girls, being one of the few options where young girls could see someone like themselves in the leading role. Music that inspires people with its intensity, with the beauty, the intricacy, villains that feel larger than life, and heroes who overcome all odds to defeat evil, bringing fairy tales and legends to life in ways that keep these stories in the hearts and imaginations of children and adults alike for years and years to come. For a hundred years, this company has been delivering stories with a few high highs and a few low lows, but there was always something about it, some sort of magic about their animations. And to reach such a massive milestone, just to have this be the celebration for it, this wet fart of a film, which sort of embodies Disney's internal decaying over these 100 years. Overpowered by corporate greed, that magic has been replaced with soulless, lifeless shells of what they once had. Wish feels lazy in every way. Disney couldn't be bothered to take a risk on 2D animation. It would take too much time and effort and they didn't want to do that. So instead, they crapped out this half and half mess that looks stylistically barren and 
unfinished. Disney cheaped out on their music and gave us generic pop songs and meaningless lyrics that feel as empty as the vacant backgrounds of the film. I feel no love with this movie, and it's such a shame. Because I'm sure that there were people who cared. People who were legitimately excited for this film. The voice actors. Some underpaid animator. Anyone who might have seen this movie as a spark of creativity, and it feels like Disney themselves went out of their way to pump out this movie as cheaply and as quickly as possible. All for the sake of getting a quick cash grab from nostalgic Disney fans. Using the 100 year landmark not as a celebration, but as a marketing gimmick. And it's really disappointing. Wish is an empty, soulless film. It's not horrendously terrible. It's not offensively bad. It's just nothing. Truly nothing special at all. This film will likely flicker and fade away, just like a fading, dying star. A sad, quiet way to go. Thank you so much for watching. Shout out to my $10 patrons. You're all amazing. Andrew, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, Classy Critic, Noah Perkins, Sunny Shy, Jake, Amber, Hype Man, Zero to Hero, Isaiah, Scaring Crows, Messiah Complex, Jacob, Ben Sketchbook, The Watcher, Omega Fighter, Trash, Wild Pilot, Josh, Gino, Twisty, Juan, Bunkin' Duncan, and Alpha 99. I hope you liked this review. Uh, I've been thinking about Wish too much. There's been too much Wish on my mind because I made this review. So I hope you enjoyed it. What did you think if you even bothered to watch it? What do you think of the songs? I know the songs are a big hot button issue with how bad they are. <laughs> what did you think about anything I had to say about this as Disney's 100 year celebration? Any and all thoughts and opinions about this movie and any other Disney movies as well, I would love to see them in the comments below. And I hope I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.